Hi, it's Mr. Mazurkowitz, and in this video, I'm going to be talking to you guys about the structure of DNA. DNA has got to be one of the coolest molecules in all of biology, and before we can get into all the cool things that DNA does, from replication to transcription to translation, we really need to understand the basic structure of this molecule. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about the smaller units that make up a molecule of DNA, and I hope that you guys see by the end that uh, even though it looks so complex here, spinning around on the left, it's really not that hard of a molecule to get down. So our essential question today is how would you describe the basic structure of DNA? If someone were to ask you, describe or explain to me what DNA is, you should be able to kind of break it down into the smaller units, talk about some of the key ideas that we'll go through here in just a minute. Before we can get to the structure of DNA, though, it's important that we ask ourselves this question, and that is, what is DNA? So I'm sure you've all heard of and seen DNA before. You've seen this image spiraling around to the right. But when I ask people, what is DNA, what does it do? Some people can't come up with a good definition. Basically put, DNA is what we call the blueprint of life. And by that, I mean that it contains the actual instructions for making all the proteins within the cell. If you recall from earlier in the year when we talked about macromolecules, specifically proteins, we said the function of proteins is a wide range. They can do many, many things. Uh, they're enzymes, they're your traits, they're your eye color, your hair color, your immune system, they make up your muscles, your um, pretty much everything that you are. I sometimes call us walking bags of proteins. So how do we know or how do our cells know which proteins to make? It's all coded for inside our unique DNA. The reason that two people don't look the same other than identical twins is because they have a unique set of instructions and therefore make different combinations of proteins which make them look different. Uh, also, one last thing I wanted to mention is that sometimes you hear DNA ref uh, referred to as a twisted ladder or a double helix. That's because what you'll see here in a second is that DNA does look like a ladder that you would climb, and we just take that ladder and twist it around in the spiral uh, form that we call a helix. It's a double helix because there's a left side and a right side. So um, if I talk about the double helix, we're just talking about that structure you see here spinning around over to the right. So what are the structural units of DNA? So if you recall, DNA, when we talked about it as a macromolecule, we said that it is a type of nucleic acid. That's what the Na in DNA actually stands for. And nucleic acids are polymers made up of smaller repeating units that we call nucleotides. So a nucleotide is seen here off to the right, and I just wanted to recap quickly the different parts of a nucleotide. Uh, one part is a phosphate. So here's your phosphate group off, uh, over here on the left of this picture. It's got a phosphorus in the middle with oxygens around it. Another part of a nucleotide is the five carbon sugar. It is a sugar, uh, and why do we call it a five carbon sugar? Because it has five carbons. So here's carbon number one, number two, number three, four, and five. In the case of DNA, the D actually in DNA stands for deoxyribose. That is the name of this five carbon sugar. When we talk about RNA later in the year, uh, it's gonna use a different five carbon sugar called ribose. Why, that's why it's called RNA. Uh, but in DNA, it's gonna use deoxyribose. And then last but not least, probably the most important part of the nucleotide uh, is going to be this nitrogenous base. So nitrogenous bases, there are four that you need to know about uh, with DNA. Uh, one that you see pictured here, you notice it's called adenine. So adenine is one, but there are three others. There's guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And from here on out, when we talk about the genetic code, we just sometimes abbreviate these things with their first letters. So A, G, C, and T. So anytime you see a DNA molecule and they use these letters, they're referring to those different nitrogenous bases. Um, a for adenine, G for guanine, C for cytosine, and T for thymine. When we take a look at the overall picture of a DNA molecule, so when you look at this, you should just notice um, a couple of things, and there's certain um, parts to this overall molecule here. So the first thing is that DNA, like I said before, is double-stranded. That's why it's a double helix. So uh, take a look at the nucleotides here. Here's a nucleotide over here on the left side, and then there's another nucleotide right over here to the right side. And then you notice again here on the left and then right next to it on the right. They are held together by these hydrogen bonds. And if you remember, we talked about hydrogen bonds early in the year when we did properties of water. Uh, it's the same type of bond and that's what's going to connect your left side to your right side. So the two strands are held together using hydrogen bonds. Another thing is to talk about uh, two basic parts of a DNA molecule. One part is what we call the backbone of the DNA molecule. And by that, we mean the outer parts here. So if we were to picture that this is a ladder, well, the sides of the ladder here are going to be made out of the phosphate and deoxyribose. And we call it sometimes a sugar phosphate backbone. You notice that we got a phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. So that's gonna form the backbone. And what's gonna make up the rungs of my ladder, so 
Here are the rungs going across that we'd climb up if this were a ladder. That's going to be your nitrogenous bases. So you notice I have an adenine here connected to a thymine here. And that's so important that we have these in the middle. One of the reasons being is that your genetic code, again, is these A's, G's, T's, and C's. They're kind of protected there by that backbone. Um, so if, again, if you just look at this, you should just notice that the sugars and phosphates, they form the outer part or the backbone, while the um, nitrogenous bases form the rungs of that ladder, and they're held together with those hydrogen bonds. Now, when it came to understanding how we put left side to right side together, uh, there were a bunch of scientists involved. Watson and Crick were two, Rosalind Franklin, but there was another scientist by the name of Erwin Shargaff. And what Erwin Shargaff figured out were a couple of rules that we have when we're building this structure of DNA. We actually call it Shargaff's rules because, well, when you figure something out, we get to name it. What Shargaff figured out is when he was analyzing DNA, he would notice, that, or he was trying to figure out the components of, let's say, a DNA molecule. And what he noticed was when he analyzed a certain DNA molecule, let's say he was figuring out how much adenine made up that DNA molecule. So A, let's say he figured out 30% of that DNA molecule uh, was A. What he started to notice is, well, hey, the T, or thymine, that too also made up 30% of this DNA molecule. And the C was made up of 20%, well, so was the G. The G might have been made up by 20%. And that might have been one strand of DNA, so not all DNA is the same. What he would do is analyze a different uh, strand of DNA. Let's say this time he found out that A, in this case, made up 10% of the molecule. Well, again, the T made up 10%. And when he analyzed the C, he found that that made up 40% in this case, and G made up 40%. And this all added up to be 100%. But what he started to notice was the pattern that you might have caught on to already, and that is that the amount of A's always matched the amount of T's, the amount of C's matched the amount of G's. So when Shargaff shared this information with other scientists, uh, specifically Watson and Crick, what they put together is what is known as a base pairing rule. And that's to mean that every time that you have an A, there must be a T across from it. And every time you have a C, there must be a G across from that. And that explains why there's always an equal amounts of A's and T's and always equal uh, C's and G's. So again, adenine and thymine always join across from each other with those hydrogen bonds, and cytosine and guanine are always joined together. And that was due to Shargaff, um, again, analyzing that DNA, and that's in a crucial part. So if I give you one strand of DNA, you should be able to tell me what the complementary strand is by using that rule. Every time you see a C, you know a G is across from it. If you have a T, an A must be across from it, and so forth and so on. One last thing to talk about here is that when we talk about DNA and its double strand, we call the two strands anti-parallel. And to show you what I mean by that, I just wanted to kind of revisit uh, our nucleotides here. So here I have two nucleotides, a cytosine and a guanine, C and G. And before I uh, describe it, I just wanted to remind you guys that remember deoxyribose is a five carbon sugar. And what we actually do is we number those uh, carbons. So to show you, uh, this one here is what we call the one prime carbon. This one here is called the two prime carbon. This one here is the three prime carbon. Over here is my four prime. And then up here is my five prime. The two I want you to focus on right now are the five and the three. You notice that three is at the bottom and five is at the top. So this is what we call the five prime end. Down here would be the three prime end. And the same thing could happen with this guy down here. I'd have my five prime here and my three prime down here. All right, and I'll talk about the significance of that in just a second. So here are my two nucleotides. Remember, C always wants to be across from G. But you notice when I try to move them across from each other, and bind them with that hydrogen bond, my left side and right side, well, my G is, on, is too far away from my C. So what could I do to get my C and G next to each other? Anytime we're building this, I have to take the nucleotides on the right side, and i got to flip them upside down. Now I can get those hydrogen bonds between my uh, C and G and my A and T. Now, if you take a look at what just happened here, remember that this is my 5 prime end and 3 prime. You notice that this nucleotide, my 3 prime is up here now because it's upside down. My 5 prime is down here. So my left side and right side of my DNA molecule are going to be what we call anti-parallel. They run next to each other, so they are parallel, but anti-parallel because they're more or less running in opposite directions. So when I say that it's an anti-parallel, you can take a look at here's a whole DNA molecule. Again, notice over here that they named this the 5' prime end, and this is the 3' prime end because all the 5' prime carbons are at the top, the 3' primes are at the bottom. But it's the opposite with my right side. My 5' prime is down here while my 3' prime is here. So the two strands of DNA run in opposite directions, and again, we just call that anti-parallel. So the left side is going to have a 5 prime and 3 prime running this way, 
while the other strand next to it is going to be 3 prime running down to 5 prime on the opposite. That's going to come into play when we talk about replication in the future, but just something that you should have an understanding of now. The two strands run in opposite directions. One side is you can think of as up, uh, upside down compared to the other one. That's pretty much it. So uh, that is the essentials of what you need to understand about the structure of DNA. Um, so you should at this point be able to go through the nucleotides, parts of a nucleotide, some of those base pairing rules and have an understanding about how we put this whole thing together. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to go back or leave any comments, questions that you have. But I hope that you guys learned something from this video. See you soon.